This week, Girls on Film becomes Gays on Film in support of the groundbreaking LGBTQ plus rom-com Bros. Here's writer and star Billy Eichner. One of the things we were trying to do is to be honest and authentic about the, like, the particulars of gay life, which, which might seem a little idiosyncratic to a straight person who's not as familiar with it. But we wanted to, you know, to show those and present those with that same type of classic Nora Ephron glow. I also speak to director Nick Stoller and co-star Luke McFarlane. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I'm going to get that gun of mine, and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. Some people call me a freak. I hate that word. I don't believe in it. Better yet, I don't believe in labels. You know, I think you're the only girl in the world that can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. Because I'm up at five every morning working my ass off. Does someone want to just tell me to my face, you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? Hello and welcome to Girls on Film. We are partnering with the film Bros to bring you a special episode devoted to the first romantic comedy from a major film studio about two gay men. It stars Billy Eichner as famous podcaster Bobby and Luke McFarlane as macho lawyer Aaron. It's funny, it's refreshing and it brings LGBTQ plus representation right into the mainstream with central characters who are gay, lesbian, trans and bisexual, both on screen and in real life. I don't think I'm his type. How do you know? Because I know. He told me he likes country music and his favorite singer is Garth Brooks. What kind of gay man says his favorite singer is Garth Brooks? That scares me. Plus I see the guys he likes, they all look exactly like him. They're all these like big, hot, straight acting dudes. It's just not me. Here's my chat with Billy, Luke, and director Nick Stoller. Welcome to Girls on Film Podcast. Thank you. So we, we are a female-focused podcast usually, but we love <laughs> representation on film. So I have an announcement for this episode. In support of our allies, we're going to be called Gays on Film. Oh, oh nice. That's nice. So thank you for being on Gays on Film. <laughs> um, can I ask each of you to tell the listeners your role in the project and how you came to it? Sure, I'll, I'll start. I'm Luke McFarlane. I play Aaron. Uh, I went in and auditioned for the part, like the old fashion actor that I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you got it. And I got it, believe it or not. Congratulations. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. I'm Billy Eichner. I play Bobby Lieber in the movie, and I also co-wrote the movie with a man you're about to meet named Nick Stoller. I'm Nick Stoller. I co-wrote the film, and I'm the director of the movie. I want to start with the question about all the central cast are LGBTQ+. And that's including some of the straight roles, right? Would any of you like to talk about that decision? Because I think that's fascinating. Sure. That's something we were all excited about. Luke was the first person we cast, and we knew we wanted to make sure that my love interest was also being played by an openly gay actor. That was important to everyone at Universal and Judd and me and Nick. And then once we made that decision, it just made sense that for this particular movie, we thought it would be exciting if the whole cast was LGBTQ, even playing the straight characters. Not to make any sort of political statement about you know who should play what roles but just to take this as an opportunity to showcase how many hilarious performers there are in the lgbtq community across generations from different cultural backgrounds that have never been given an opportunity like this to star in a movie that's being produced and distributed by a major studio at this scale you know and um there are so many funny people once we started auditioning people we just kept looking at each other like oh my god like how does this person not have their own tv series how does this person not already starring in their own you know romantic comedy and so uh it just made sense and i think historically for some of the most high profile LGBTQ roles, most of the of those that Hollywood has made have gone to straight actors, right? And there's nothing inherently wrong with that, except that it's always been so imbalanced because LGBTQ actors have had to struggle so much in terms of getting those same types of opportunities. And so this was just a chance to correct that imbalance a little bit and 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 show people what we're capable of. And there's a funny scene in the film where your characters go to see one of those movies with a straight actor playing a gay role. Uh, would any of you like to speak a little bit about that? Because that was very funny and quite on the nose, I think, yeah. in terms of the film industry. Oh, yeah. There was a movie within the movie called The Treasure Inside about two closeted uh, gay frontiersmen. And we actually tried to shoot it, uh, but we couldn't find anyone to play that. We, want, we needed two kind of serious straight actors to play this kind of Oscar bait movie. And at first we thought maybe it was just scheduling issues. And then we realized, oh, 
actors are afraid to make fun of the Oscars because they all want to win one, and they're yeah. afraid to. Uh, and they, and I think a lot of them also maybe might want to play gay at some point, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so we couldn't find anyone uh, to do it. And we had some really funny stuff written for it, but. Yeah. Um, to his credit, Liam Hemsworth did want to do it, yeah. and we zoomed with him. And when he he was in Australia at the time, and and he was lovely and and thought it was hilarious. Um, but then you know Australia had a very severe COVID lockdown just as we were shooting, so he wasn't able to come just for the sake of shooting a cameo in our movie, um, unfortunately. But yeah, other than that, it, it was it was hard to find people to do it, and then we ended up not doing it. That's so interesting. Um, can I talk to you a bit about how important this is for young people? watching this comedy now i mean i mean luke when you were younger for example what would this have meant to you to have seen a film of this you know mainstream status with a cast like this and themes like this absolutely i mean we just did not have a lot of movies that were for us but also like more importantly i didn't realize i needed something like that and that's kind of the way it sort of works is like i i was not uh, i did not come out as like a 14 15 year old kid for many reasons, I'm sure, but one of them is also like, oh, we don't have happy endings. You know, the queer movies that I was aware of were sort of sad and tortured. So, you know, maybe I would have come out earlier if I could see two guys fall in love and know that they were allowed to have a happy ending. So, I mean, it would have been hugely Im impactful. Yeah, I mean, I'll say too that my, I mean, I tell you guys a story about my friend, a friend of mine whose son is gay and who's like, I think he's now. 11 or 12 he took him to the sc a screening of the movie or he took him to the movie it's out in the states and he said it was just so, it was so fun sitting there with his son who was like laughing hysterically sitting with the audience that was like half gay and like and the whole thing he just was like this is such a delight and it's so fun to share this with my son and for him to experience the movie not as like a gay rom-com but just as a rom-com it's just a romantic comedy you know and there's and there was no it's not something that's you know unique in a good way for for him, you know? Yeah, I mean, romantic comedies, even though they, they obviously, you know, there's always a little fantasy involved in them, of course, and that's what's fun about it. But especially for young people, they do give you something of a blueprint for how adult romantic relationships are gonna go. And when you don't have that as a gay kid, you're, you're kind of lost a little bit, you know? I, I remember, I actually never told the story until now, and it's our last interview. <laughs> but um, uh, my first—I was about to have my first kiss ever with a with a girl, my girlfriend in, in junior high school or middle school, and um, she had already kissed guys, and I had never kissed anyone. And she said, "Oh, you'll be fine. You've seen people kiss in movies." She was like, "That's what you do. That's what it's like." Uh, that's and it's interesting, and that was true. That was how I knew what to do, you know. But there was no gay equivalent of it when I was a kid. So you know, I think whether it's a movie like Bros or something like Heartstopper or Schitt's Creek, whatever it might be, the fact that these movies are being made and that are showcasing gay love stories and sexuality, like uh, we need those stories because it, it does give young people uh, a bit of a blueprint for love and romance. And how to kiss. And how to kiss. Yeah. And in our, well, I won't go there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, onto the sex. I mean, this is a 15 certificate over here. Um, what kind of conversations did you have about getting the right balance of realism, authenticity, being funny and being sexy? We always focused on whatever the, that particular scene required. You know, I think um, in that first sex scene that we have, well, not the first one, actually, the second one, but at the first one, that's just the two of us. Yeah. Um, the first one involves four people. but um, And then the last one involves four people. But uh, there are a few in between that just involve the two of us. And, you know, there's that big one at when we're hooking up for the first time. And the focus there was, you know, these characters are both trying to front as being really tough and, you know, kind of like stereotypically masculine and strong and, you know, trying still trying to keep like intimacy and vulnerability at arm's length, even though they're literally hooking up with each other. And also it's there for physical comedy, right? Um, because sex can be very funny. And so we just focused on whatever the scene required. You know, later in the movie, there are scenes where they are now dating and becoming more comfortable being vulnerable with each other. So those aren't played for laughs. Those are played to see like how honest and earnest and sweet they can be together, which is a step... Uh, uh, you know, a progress uh, for these two characters. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think you touched on there about how kind of sex positive this film is generally. And there, there's a lot of different kinds of relationships which are shown in this film. It's, it seems very inclusive to me on that side. Would anyone like to speak to that a bit? Yeah, it is. I mean, there's many different kinds of intimacy. And I think we really need to be able to sort of 
to sort of show that. And and to that point too, I also think it's 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 good for a sort of our straight audience to be reminded of the number of times that gay people have watched two uh, heterosexual people have intimate scenes together and mm-hmm. posed zero judgment on that. I certainly never had judgment of that. And I would I would ask and encourage people to do the same thing of our movie, not as an educational thing, but even just to have that conversation with yourself of like, why does this make me feel a little bit different, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I also say too, in terms of all the sex scenes, like every, almost every movie I've made uh, uh, has had sex scenes in them and they're always big, funny comedy set pieces. And like, first and foremost, this movie is designed to make you laugh really hard and hope, hopefully cry a little bit in a good way, you know? And and to tell a romantic, an R-rated romantic comedy without sex would be dishonest and weird. I mean, sex is a huge part of romance. And yeah. so we, from the very beginning, I don't think Billy and I even talked about it. We were just like, this is just going to be part of this movie. Yeah. Like, it has to be, yeah. you know? It, it wasn't yeah. like a, a political statement. No. I mean, it, it was, was just like, what made sense for the story. And, you know, and if there is a little bit of a shock value to it, that's part of the fun. That's why it makes it worth going to see and why it stands out. Yeah. I like that this is very much about the joy of relationships as well, not so much about the challenges. On Girls on Film, certainly that's something we like to celebrate is seeing queer love stories, which are happy, you know? So thank you for that. Are there any other romantic comedies that influenced any of you um, with this one? I, I mean, obviously you're breaking new ground here, but anything else that springs to mind? Yeah, I mean, many, you know, we obviously share a love of those Nora Ephron movies um, that we grew up watching when Harry Met Sally and Sleepless in Seattle and You've Got Mail. And, you know, I think one of the things we were trying to do is to be honest and authentic about the, like the particulars of gay life, which which might seem a little idiosyncratic to sort of someone, to a straight person who's not as familiar with it, but we wanted to, you know, to show those and present those with that same type of classic Nora Ephron glow. You know, and all that like delight and charm she brought to her movies. Like, there's no reason that that shouldn't apply to gay stories as well. Why are you getting so upset? This is not about you. Yes, it is. You are a human affront to all women, and I am a woman. Hey, I don't feel great about this, but I don't hear anyone complaining. Of course not. You're out the door too fast. I think they have an okay time. How do you know? I mean, how do I know I know? Because they. Yes, because they... How do you know that they're really... What are you saying? That they fake orgasm? It's possible. Get out of here. Why? Most women at one time or another have faked it. Well, they haven't faked it with me. How do you know? So I like that. Um, And, um, you know, Annie Hall and, and some of those movies that we grew up with that were very dialogue, you know, heavy in, in ways that uh, movies really aren't allowed to be anymore. Like movie, the, the characters in those movies were allowed to speak like adults and, and took a lot of like, you know, time with uh, the way they spoke to each other, the amount they were allowed to speak to each other. It wasn't all just physical comedy, you know. Um, the characters just had conversations and part of the ways we saw them connect and fall in love was by by like sort of sparring verbally, you know, and we don't see that as much anymore. And I've always liked that sort of a thing. So there's a lot of it in in bros. Yeah, me too. I love a lot of talking. And your character is also a podcaster, which we love. <laughs> it's great, great to see that depicted real representation. We feel seen. Yeah, <laughs> there's nothing sexier than a podcaster. <laughs> but I will say I will say this of podcasters is it it is like, um, I, th- yeah, I think about Aaron having listened to Bobby and that experience of the relationship with your audience. It is such an intimate experience. Like it is such a, you guys bring a sort of like friendship and a sort of closeness that another medium doesn't really do. Oh, that's nice to hear. And let's talk about some of the other cast. I mean, in terms of the cameos, Deborah Messing, how wonderful to have her in there. Um, whose idea was that? How did that come about? Deborah Messing, um, my character in the movie uh, is on the board that's organizing what will be New York's first LGBTQ plus history museum, which actually does not exist in New York, which is crazy because we have museums about literally everything else. <laughs> um, and New York is a gay mecca and we still don't really have that. And so it's true. Yeah, we thought that would be a really interesting environment and allow us to nod to LGBTQ history and also poke fun at our own community. No! That is old-fashioned heteronormative nonsense. We need to get people to rethink history through a queer prism, not comfort them with another gay wedding, all right? It's a museum. It's not Schitt's Creek. Oh, I like Schitt's Creek. I love Schitt's Creek. That show has layers. Everyone loves Schitt's Creek. Great, okay. That's who you remind me of, Eugene Levy. 
And Nick and I thought from the beginning that this museum would definitely have a, a straight celebrity ally who was looking to donate and support the museum, right? And make a show of it. And Deborah Messing just being sort of this gay icon and part of a real landmark piece of gay pop culture with Will and Grace just always struck us as someone it would be really funny to, to play that role. And then she really relished the opportunity to turn the image we all have of her from Will and Grace on its head. And she told us it was the first time she's ever been allowed to curse in a movie and get really angry. And she just had so much fun with it. And it was so fun watching her do it and she just crushes in the movie it's like so funny it? so funny and the audience just loves seeing it it's such a it's such like a turn that you don't expect you know you don't see it coming from her and it's what every actor wants to do is defy their expectations of you mm. you know and just as a comedy fan i just was really excited to get to work she's such a legend from a comedy perspective uh, I was pretty nervous, <laughs> weirdly working with her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I mentioned this is groundbreaking. Obviously, times are thankfully changing. But Nick, were there any particular challenges in actually at any point? I know you've had great support from your wonderful producers, but any challenges in getting some people somewhere to kind of accept this film and get it made? No, not. I mean, we, you know, we worked on this on the pitch for about six months before we pitched it to Judd, who's like an old friend of mine at this point. And then we brought to Universal and Universal like wanted to do it right away. And we were actually going to make it, shoot it in March of 2020 when the pandemic happened. And we had a delay. I was literally scouting it at the time. And we had a delay for a year and a half. But that was really the only challenge was the pandemic, which was a challenge for everyone on earth, <laughs> you know, not just for us. So, um, so yeah, so it wasn't ever, you know, and then Universal put all their marketing muscle behind it and they gave us like a nice budget to make the movie. And, you know, it was... Yeah, no, there wasn't really, there weren't, there weren't those roadblocks. It felt like this was like, this is this movie was long overdue and that was the main feeling uh, from everyone. Mm -hmm. Could I ask each of you, I know you've had a lot of reactions from people, um, to, to pick a reaction that you'd like to talk about, hopefully positive to the film of people who've seen it. I've just gotten, you know, flooded with uh, messages on Instagram, private messages for the most part of people not just LGBTQ people or gay men, but a lot of LGBTQ people and, and gay men just telling me how surprisingly emotional the experience of watching the movie in a movie theater was for them, especially gay men, I think, of a certain generation, my generation and older. Or sometimes I hear from the parents of LGBTQ kids, you know, that the movie, while it's, you know, it's primarily a comedy and there's tons of jokes and physical comedy and we made it to make people laugh out loud a lot. But I think it has, it is having a real profound effect on, you know, queer people who just haven't seen movies like this, which tried to, in an entertaining, uplifting way, reflect our lives in an authentic way. And I think the happy ending of it is one that um, makes gay men especially very emotional because I think we all as men and as gay men have a hard time admitting that we actually do want that happy ending. You know, uh, we've talked ourselves out of wanting it for various reasons or thinking it's possible. Um, and I think when they see it happen, especially among two characters who on the surface you wouldn't necessarily think would, would be drawn to each other, I think it make it sort of sort of forces you to admit that it's something that you want that you don't have, and um, and we haven't seen that play out on a big screen very often, and I think that can be powerful for people. So getting those messages has really meant a lot to me. Um, and what's great about those messages is that it's coming from people who've actually seen the movie, and it's not just kind of empty, vapid, knee-jerk discourse from people who haven't seen the movie. My twin sister was able to come to the movie, and she says. You, you look fantastic in it. I hope now you will stop working out so much. <laughs> <laughs> so <That's> funny. <laughs> she's not wrong. Well, she, yeah, she, she's, she's, she thinks I spend too much time at the gym. And I say, I live in Hollywood, Ruth. <laughs> uh, you know, a friend of mine whose parents are pretty religious went to see it. And I, when he first told me that, I was like, oh, no, they're going to like, I mean, he's a really close friend of mine. And I wasn't sure, like if they would be, I don't know, weird around. I have no idea. I just was like nervous. And they to they called him. He warned them. He was like, if you're going to see it, just so you know, it's pretty explicit. And they, they called him and they said, it was so moving. Mm -hmm. And then the dad was like, it's not explicit. I don't know. <laughs> like, it was just funny. But they were like, it was so moving. And that to me, and they're like, 
in their 70s, wow. Christian scientists live in New Hampshire, mm-hmm. like which is a you know a rural rural New Hampshire, which is rural, uh, and loved it. What? <laughs> they're lesbians? No, they're not. Yeah. No, they're, they're no, they're and it's that to me is uh, demonstrates how kind of universal and relatable the film is. Yeah. You know, um, I think that there's been a lot of like it's historic this, it's LGBTQ that, but like to me watching the movie every time it's just it's just a moving film about two human beings falling in love and. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's just a lovely thing that anyone can kind of relate to and that we've seen every, everyone relate to. I agree. I, I feel moved just thinking about it. Well, thank you all so much for joining Girls on Film Meets Gays on Film and congratulations again. Great to meet you all. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Take care. That was Billy Eichner, Luke McFarlane and Nick Stoller. Bros is in UK cinemas now. Girls on Film is an HLA production brought to you by executive producer Hedda Archbold, producer Lydia Scott, audio producer Jenny Nelson and intern Ellie Hardy. This episode is in partnership with the film Bros. Thanks for listening. Oh my God. Gay sex was more fun when straight people were uncomfortable with it.